Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Acts 20, verses 1 through 16. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through the, those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There, there he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopatar, the Berean son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. They went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank deep into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, do not be alarmed for his life is still in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Essos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos. And the day after that, we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem if possible on the day of Pentecost. This is God's word. Good morning, first of Anne. It's good to be back with you guys. If I haven't met you before, my name is Jason Seville. I'm one of the pastors at Delray Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Before that, I was pastoring a church in China for six years, uh, supported uh, by uh, First Evangelical Church as I was there. And uh, we were in Shanghai, China for six years. Before that, we were here. Uh, I, uh, my wife and I had just graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary and moved here in 2010, uh, where uh, I was uh, on staff here with Downline Ministries. As we did that, we, we landed here in Memphis and had a list of churches to, to check out and had a list of, of three or four churches that we were going to go to. And uh, I think First of Anne was maybe the, the second church we had gone to. And uh, we gave every church two weeks. And as we were leaving here after our second week at First of Anne, uh, in the, as we were leaving, uh, my wife said, man, I know we have to go and check out these other churches, but I'm just going to miss First of Anne. I was like, yeah, me too. And then about Wednesday of that week, she said it again. She said, gosh, I know we got to go to another church on Sunday, but I'm just going to miss First of Anne. And I was like, Kim, we don't have to keep looking at churches. Uh, we can land here if this is, so that, that's what we did. We stopped looking at churches and we landed here and became members uh, in 2010. Uh, we're members here through 2014 where we were sent uh, by First of Anne to, uh, to go to China uh, where, where we were there for, for a season. So I bring greetings from uh, the saints at, uh, Ale uh, in Alexandria, Virginia at Delray Baptist Church, and uh, my wife and, and kids uh, uh, send their greetings as well. I, I apologize to everybody I meet this morning. They're like, hey, good to see you. Where's your wife? It's good to see you. Where are your kids? So I get it. I would be the same way. 
Um, well, let's pray one more time. Ask God's blessing on the proclaiming of his word. Father, we do praise you and the Son and the Spirit as our one God. God, you alone are worthy of worship and of our lives. And would you encourage us this morning through your word? Would you challenge us by it? Would you stir our affections for Jesus? And would you give us help in both the proclaiming and the receiving of your word? We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, in 1985, uh, an educator and, and cultural critic named Neil Postman wrote a, a shocking and prophetic book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Has anybody read Amusing Ourselves to Death? Oh, a couple people. Man, all right. Well, Amusing Ourselves to Death, fantastic book. The subtitle was this, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. So Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. When I read the book back in college, the front cover had a kind of a family of skeletons sitting on the couch watching TV uh, was the cover that would really kind of draw you in. So Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. And as both the title and the subtitle suggests there, what Postman is doing is he's taking the reader on a journey through the history of media to show how entertainment begins to erode our ability to think. Uh, how, how media and entertainment uh, begins to erode our ability to, to think well and to reason and to string thoughts together sequentially into argument and, and to logic. He begins one of his chapters with an illustration from the 1858 Illinois senatorial debates between Abraham Lincoln and the incumbent Stephen Douglas. Lincoln and Douglas had a series of seven debates, and the format was this. One of the gentlemen would get up and would give an opening statement for an hour. Then the other would have an hour and a half to respond, followed by 30 minutes of rebuttal by the first gentleman. So a three hour event in total, 60 minute opening, 90 minute response, 30 minute rebuttal. And these debates would draw over 20,000 people would come for that. And those debates were considered short for those two men. There was actually one occasion where, uh, where Stephen Douglas began with a three hour opening statement. And Lincoln was getting up to give his own three hour rebuttal and he looked at the time and it was dinner time. And he said, you know what guys, I got three hours and then I have to allow him time to respond to that. Why don't you guys go eat dinner and then come back for my three hour response? And they did, <laughs> they did it, they came back. They were all about it, they wanted to be there for that. Needless to say, times have changed. Our political debates today, if you could even call them by that name, are mere sound bites by comparison. But it's not just our political debates. It's not just that, that that's an illustration. Uh, Postman is using that as an illustration of a bigger problem, of a larger issue at play. We are a culture of sound bites. We are a culture of quick images. We are a culture of thoughtless social media posts. We are a culture of small windows of time and narrow margins. Now, we're not gonna to try to solve all of those issues this morning in the sermon. So if you're like, yes, we are, what do we do about it? That's not my point. I'm not gonna to try to solve all those issues. Indeed, I don't think I can. However, this is what I want you to see. I want you to recognize that, that the, the, the cultural air you breathe and the cultural air that I breathe that has put us in a place where we may need some recalibration over what it is we should do with our time. What type of effort and intentionality would it be wise to employ toward activities that would truly be good for you and good for me, good for our souls? What might we be missing out on by going with the flow of this is the way that our culture is versus fighting for something richer and deeper? What kind of interactions may we have? What kind of experiences may we have that would be formative for us and truly edifying for us, supplying what it is that our souls truly need and truly desire? Well, our passage today that was just read, Acts chapter 20, I think serves as uh, something of a recalibration on that topic. 
Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 12. I know I, I put, I told them uh, through 16. I think we're just going to stop at verse 12. Acts chapter 20, verses uh, 1 through 12. If you don't have a copy of God's word, there's one in the pew, the pew rack in front of you. It's on page 929. If you want to find our passage there, Acts 20, verses 1 through 12. And here's what I want to argue. We must devote significant time and effort toward Christian maturity. So what I want to argue from our text, we must devote significant time and, uh, and uh, effort toward Christian encouragement. I want to look at this in, in kind of two scenes, two points. If you're a note taker, if that just helps you to follow along. Point number one is this, essential to the Christian life is encouragement. Point number two, essential to Christian encouragement is the gathering. Number one, essential to the Christian life is encouragement. Number two, essential to Christian encouragement is the gathering. Look there with me at the text in Acts chapter 20. Point number one, essential to the Christian life is encouragement. At this point in the book of Acts, if you haven't read it recently or maybe have never read it, what is going on here is that Paul is, uh, has just taken a, a series of three missionary journeys. And where we are in Acts chapter 20 is on the tail end of that. Some scholars call this uh, Paul's farewell tour. So he's just wrapping up his three missionary journeys of fame and he's coming back and he's visiting these churches and these Christians that he had either planted or strengthened along the way. And he's coming back through giving kind of these farewell messages on this farewell tour on his way to Jerusalem. He is on kind of a breakneck pace to get back to Jerusalem. He wants to get there by the day of Pentecost. He and these people that are traveling with him have collected a whole bunch of money because there was a drought in Jerusalem. They collected all this money and they were trying to get that back and give it to the saints in Jerusalem. And along the way, uh, what we have here in Acts chapter 20 is kind of a bridge between his final missionary journey and that last recorded stop that we have in the city of Jerusalem where he delivers that financial gift. So just to locate you a little bit about where we are in the book of Acts, that's where we are. Now, as we read that passage, the thing that probably jumps out to everybody's mind is the Eutychus thing, right? Oh my goodness, there's a boy sitting in the window and he fell out and he's dead and raised back to life or something happened there. And our, our, our temptation, I think, would be to read this passage and to focus in on that because that's a kind of a big deal uh, that this boy died and fell out of the window. But, but there's something more that Luke is doing here. There's something more that he is trying to communicate here, and that's what I want to draw our attention to first before we get into the, the Eutychus event. I want to draw your attention to what I think Luke's focus is in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 12. There's a word that shows up three times in those first six verses that clues us into Luke's focus and the point of these travels on this farewell tour. It's the word encourage. Encourage. Look at verse 1. It says that Paul sent for the disciples. And what that means, he's not talking about the kind of 12 apostles. He's talking about the, the, the Christians who were in Ephesus. Right? So Paul sends for the disciples. And after encouraging them, you see that word there. After encouraging them, he said farewell and departed. Now look at verse 2, where Luke is describing Paul's visits to these other regions. Having given them what? Much encouragement. Presumably in each place that he visited, that's what he was doing. That's what he was all about. He called the, 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 the Christians together in Ephesus to encourage them. And as he's going and visiting these other places, he, he's encouraging them, having given them much encouragement. He moves on from there. Then look down at verse 12. Again, we'll touch on this as we cover the, the Eutychus event in our, in our second point. But after the boy is raised from the dead, they continue to fellowship. They continue to worship together. And it wraps up by saying they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. If you're reading from the ESV like I am, that's what it says. But the, the, the Greek word there is the exact same word that we have in verses 1 and 2 for encourage. Right, so, so in verses, verse 1 in Ephesus, he encouraged them, and then he goes through the other regions, he encouraged them. And then at the end, uh, Luke uses that same word again, that, he, uh, that after this boy was raised from the dead, they were not a little encouraged or not a little comforted. The Greek word there is the word parakaleo. It's a word that could be uh, translated either way, comforted, encouraged. Now, I'm about to do something that you can't always do with Greek. And so if you dabble in original languages or like to do that in your own time in Bible study and, and things like that, you can't always take a word and then dissect it and say, well, that's what it means, right? So English, butterfly, right? You can't, I had a Greek professor that used to draw a big rectangle on the board with wings and he'd write butterfly, right? You, you can't do that. A butterfly is not a flying stick of butter. 
Uh, the, the English word understand. Well, it, it's not like, well, what that really means is that there's a stand and you're kind of under. Like that. That's not, you, you can't do that with words and derive their meaning. All right, so be careful if, if you dabble in that way. However, there are times where the, the parts of a compound word do help us arrive a little bit at what their meaning is. And so here, the, 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 the uh, Greek prefix para means uh, beside or uh, alongside. And kaleo means to call. And, and, and so uh, parakaleo, one, and indeed, one of the ways that parakaleo is used and thus translated is to call to one side. If you call somebody to your side or you come along somebody else, it, it is called to, to parakaleo, to come beside of or to call to one's side. At other times, the, the situation in the context is much more pressing uh, and, and the word is translated to urge, to beg, to implore. It's like you not just want somebody beside you, but you need them beside you. You are begging them, you are urging them, you are imploring them. The context will depend how you translate that, but that's one of the ways that it's translated. And so uh, here what we have with this word to call to one side or to come alongside of somebody, it, it, it's the idea uh, that, that encouragement isn't the idea of just being cordial, right? We might think of it that way. Oh, that's a nice outfit you have on today. Oh, well, thank you. Well, that was a very encouraging conversation. That's not what we're talking about. That's encouraging. That's great. Compliment what each other are wearing, I guess. But that's not exactly what the idea is here. No, it's an interaction with others where you are coming alongside of them or calling them alongside of you and you're adding courage to them. You're, you're building them up. You're helping to shoulder their burdens in some way. You are, through your speech or your conduct, you're giving them resolve, you're giving them a boost, you're stirring their affections in some way, you're helping to shoulder their burdens in some way, you, you, to, to where that person is empowered, that person is fueled for the Christian life. All right, so not just a compliment that's nice and kind, but some way that you are building somebody up in Jesus, in Christ, in a way that would fuel them and empower them for the Christian life. As such, you have to see that encouragement, the content of encouragement is Jesus. The content of encouragement is Christ. That is how we are built up. That is how we are strengthened. That's how we are empowered is by getting more of Jesus, more of Christ, and being built up in that way. And so, so friends, this is what Paul is doing. This is what Paul was all about. If, if you would, let's look at the text again. Here's what I, I want to observe. Four evidences that this was Paul's priority. Four evidences that, that we can say, yep, Paul was all about encouragement. That's what he, that was his ministry, that was foremost in his mind. Four evidences of Paul's priority of encouragement in our text. The first one is this, his traveling is evidence of it. Paul's traveling is evidence of it, encouragement. Again, it's what he made sure he did in Ephesus. Verse one, he made sure that he encouraged them in Ephesus before he moved on. It was his goal in Macedonia. And it's a result of his time in Troas. Again, you kind of look at this text, you're like, even if it, as it was read, man, he's bouncing around all these places, we've got a bunch of places and people, what's going on here? Well, one of the things Luke is showing is that every place he, he goes, this is the result. Every place that he is, right? He's traveling to all of these places, not just to take in the sights. He didn't have a bucket list and he had to go to Troas before he died. He's not going because, uh, just because he's got family in town. He's not even going because it's always the easiest journey to take. We'll see that in a second. Sometimes it's a harder journey for him to take. Not because he had extended family there. No, he's doing it to strengthen and to encourage the churches in those places. And this isn't a one-off. Paul was all about this elsewhere. Acts chapter 14, verse 22 in Galatia. When Paul was in Galatia, it says he was in Galatia, quote, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them, same word, to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. The author of Hebrews says, so not just Paul, you're like, ah, Paul's a special guy. He was all about encouragement. No, the author of Hebrews says, this is what we all need. Hebrews chapter three, verse 13 says, but exhort one another, parakaleo, encourage one another, but encourage one another every day, as long as it's still called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. If you're not encouraging each other day by day, as long as it's called today, you are in danger of being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Paul to the saints in Galatia said, the reason that we were doing this is that there are tribulations and trials that are coming. And so we need to encourage one another to fortify ourselves and to add courage and to strengthen and build ourselves up so that we are ready for those times of tribulation and those times of trial. That's something for all of us to do and something that all of us need. 
We must be devoted to encouragement. And so Paul does it everywhere he goes, and he goes places in order to do it. So his traveling is evidence. Second thing I think in our text that is evidence of, of this is Paul's priority is his writing while traveling. His writing while traveling is evidence of it as well. Now this is a little bit between the lines of our text, but it's important enough to mention. Look at verse 1. He says farewell, and he departs, in verse 1, for Macedonia. It's from Macedonia that he writes a letter that we know as 2 Corinthians. So in this text where he's all about encouragement, he sits down in one of those towns and sends off a letter to Corinth that we know as 2 Corinthians. Now listen, I can't make this up. Listen to how 2 Corinthians begins. This is how Paul starts his letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and, God, and the God of all parakaleo who parakaleos us in our affliction so that we may be able to parakaleo those who are in any affliction with the parakaleo with which we ourselves are parakaleoed by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in parakaleo too. If we are afflicted, it is for your parakaleo and salvation. And if we are parakaleo, it is for your parakaleo, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our parakaleo. Think this was on Paul's mind? Ten times in the opening verses of his letter to the Second Corinthians, or the letter to the Corinthians that we call 2 Corinthians. He has this, this is what he's thinking about. This is what he wants to do. This is his goal. This is his priority in the Christian life. So he sends that letter off. Look at Acts chapter 20. If you followed me to 2 Corinthians, you can be back in Acts chapter 20, verse two. He goes through those regions, giving encouragement to all the Christians there. Then he goes to Greece for three months, then back through Macedonia once again. And it's there that he writes a letter that we know is the book of Romans. So right here in this kind of farewell tour is where he writes 2 Corinthians and the book of Romans. Now, as he writes Romans, you know how Romans begins? Book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually parakaleoed by each other's faith both yours and mine. He's writing to the Romans, it's on his mind. He says, I long to see you because I want to strengthen you and I want each of us to encourage one another. That's my goal. That's why I want to come to Rome. Or one of the reasons he wants to go to Rome. All right, so back in Acts 20, right? he's traveling to accomplish this encouragement. He's thinking about it in his downtime. He's writing to other Christians elsewhere to encourage them and to inform them of his plans when they couldn't get together for more encouragement. Which, by the way, I'll just kind of pause and give a little side application there. Here, here, there's multiple ways to encourage somebody. Right? Some of you in, in your season of life, you've got a bunch of kids and maybe you're homeschooling, you're a stay-at-home mom, and you're like, gosh, when do I have time to do that? Well, there's, there's many different ways we can do it. Some seasons it looks like us getting together with people for coffee at a coffee shop. Other times you can't even hear yourself think because everything's going on around you. Like that's reality. That's real life. But there's another way. Paul shoots off a letter at times when he wants to encourage people. We can encourage each other by text messages or by emails or by writing a note or by inviting people over and practicing hospitality. There's many, many different ways that we can do this. But just note that Paul, it's his driving force and he's doing whatever way he can do it. He's trying to work it into his life. All right, so his priority of encouragement, you see it in his traveling, you see it in his writing. And then number three, you see it in his companions for traveling. His companions for traveling. Look there again at verses four and five of Acts 20. We see Paul travel from uh, Macedonia down through Troas, and these verses show that he wasn't alone, right? There, there are seven brothers mentioned there, not counting Luke, who was, uh, apparently had joined back up with Paul. You see in verse 5, it says us, right? Luke is writing this, and he includes himself in the group. And then in verse 6 and following, he uses the word we. So, so Paul has this kind of traveling band of people with him. Luke is a part of that. And they're traveling, and it's important that Luke notes where they're from. He doesn't just give a list of names. He gives a list of names and then talks about where each of these people are from as well. The reason that's important is that these brothers are all from places that Paul had, where Paul had planted churches and strengthened churches. 
So he went and planted churches, strengthened churches, and then collected some of these brothers with him to, to go down for really for accountability uh, and just for, the, for the, the encouragement along the way to go and deliver this gift down in Jerusalem. And so Paul doesn't talk about that here, kind of the money part of the trip, but in, in Romans uh, 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, those four chapters, he talks about this gift of money that he's uh, going to Jerusalem to deliver. And in those, uh, in those chapters, he indicates that, it, that saints from Macedonia and Achaia and Galatia and Corinth were banding together to send this support to Jerusalem. So Paul was on a, a mission of encouragement and having spent time in those northern regions, he wants to get down to Jerusalem to encourage the saints there and to deliver this massive financial gift to, to encourage them as well. The fourth way we see this is Paul's priority in our text is his avoiding of death while traveling. <laughs> his avoiding of death while traveling. There's a note, look at verse 3, in this kind of travel log that we have here. He's become aware of a plot made against him as he was about to set sail. So instead, instead of taking the sea route with everybody else, he takes a land route back through Macedonia. He'll do it again down in verse 13. One thing you have to remember, you just have to remember this. Anytime you're reading Paul, when you're reading Paul and you see Paul avoiding death in some way, Remember that he gives you his own interpretation of that in Philippians chapter 1. Listen to this. Philippians 1, he says, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet I do not know which, uh, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain on in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul has a strong desire, obviously, to go and be with Jesus, but he knows that if the Lord keeps him alive, whether that's through God's providential actions and ordering and guiding in his life and supernatural protection, or by Paul's own decision-making, the reason has nothing to do with Paul's desire to save his own skin. The reason has nothing to do with Paul uh, fearing the pain of death has nothing to do with it. Paul himself tells us that. No, make no mistake, the reason that Paul took that land route instead of that sea route in Acts 20 is because he needed to strengthen and encourage more Christians. He wanted to make sure that the saints in Jerusalem were ministered to and cared for. He wanted the gospel to keep pushing into places where Christ hadn't already been named. That's his driving force. First of all, do, do you see why at the beginning I said that I want to argue that we must devote significant time and effort toward Christian encouragement? Well, how do we do that? How do we do that well? You know, the Puritans had a word for this, which I found helpful. They have a word for this. And it, it, it's helpful because it's, we have these things that we want to commend for stirring our affections for Jesus. Right, certain things that we need to do to build ourselves up in the faith. And so what do you do to grow in your faith? What do you do to grow in the Lord? Well, well you, need to, you need to pray. Right, you need to spend time in prayer. It, 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 you can't be a Christian and be like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm just not really about that prayer thing. No, you, you need to pray. There needs to be time where we mark off as a congregation, as individuals to come before the Lord and to call out to him and praise who he is and to confess our sins and to petition him in various ways for things that we need, where we commune with God and we talk with him and allow him to talk with us. We have to pray. And we've got to read our Bibles, right? Bible study, so prayer and Bible study, these things are important. It has to be a time where, I, you know, where we huddle up around God's word and study scripture together and to hear it preached and, and to, to say, God, lead me. I, I don't know how to even lead my own life, but your word is good for me and it's nourishment for me and, and I need you to direct my ways. I'm always learning new things and he's, his word is active and sharp and, and it is forming us. And so we've got to pray, we've got to read our Bible. And then we've got to do something else. Something with other people. I don't have one good one word thing for it, but, but, but a time where we're getting together with other people and having good Christian conversation in a way that would be formative and building up for us. Right? The Puritans called it conference. You, mean, you might hear uh, the word conference and think of a, something that would happen in one of these hotels down the street that would be a conference that would come together. The Puritans didn't mean that by it, but they meant a time where you would get together to confer spiritual truth to one another and build each other up. They called it conference. I, I think it's helpful. 
listen, I don't know what my application is here. Maybe start using the word. I, I don't know. I just know this is a great concept and it's something that I think we should recover even if we're not using the word to be thoughtful about it. Listen to a couple of these. This is William Perkins in the late 1500s talking about conference with your family. Listen to this. Use meditation and conference about heavenly things. Assemble your family together, confer with them what they have learned from the sermon, instruct them, catechize them, read or cause to be read some of the Bible or some other godly book unto them. So they would say, get your family together and have a conference where you're intentionally talking about things about Jesus together in a way to build each other up. Nehemiah Wellington, early 1600s, talks about conference and marriage. He says that he enjoyed private prayer, followed by much sweetness and profit in reading and praying with my family. And these meditations and conference I had with my wife left lingering effects the rest of my day. Not just talking to his wife, not just, hey, how was your day? Oh, it was good. How was your day? Oh, it was good. But a way to conference with his wife in a way that left lingering spiritual effects the rest of his day. Conference and pastoral ministry, Richard Baxter, mid 1600s. He says this He says, You know, we cannot speak so familiarly and come so close to everyone's case in a common sermon as we may do by conference. So he's just talking to pastors. He says, we, we can't accomplish in one sermon, and Baxter was all about preaching and all about sermons, but we can't accomplish in one sermon what we can do when we get together in individual situations in each other's homes and do by conference. And therefore, I entreat you to allow me now and then an hour of sober talk with you when all other matters of life may be laid by. One more for the elders here in the room, the pastors. Baxter said it again. He said, study and pray and confer and practice. For in these four ways, your ability must be, must be increased. So even a pastor, he says, one of the ways that you're going to grow is through conferencing and conferring with one another for pastoral development. So church, ask yourself, how can, how can we go from just our normal conversations to something like that, whatever we're going to call it? How can we go to where, where it's not just a, kind of the normal chit-chat and you see the game yesterday and, and, and uh, you know, where are you hunting next week and uh, to, to, to take our conversations from the normal conversations and to try to get around each other, to encourage, to call alongside, to strengthen, to build each other up in a way that would, would stir our affections for Jesus and would build us up and would help us to walk the Christian life. We need that encouragement. We already saw from Hebrews that you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin if you don't have that. Paul says that there are trials and tribulations coming and if you don't have people coming alongside to encourage and add courage to you and to build you up, you're not gonna be able to go through it. Church, we need this. An essential part of the Christian life is encouragement. And essential to Christian encouragement, point number two, is the gathering. Essential to Christian encouragement is the gathering. If you look there at our text again, look in verse 7. I'll read it just to get us a head start into this second portion of, of the text. Verse 7, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them intending to depart the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were lamps in the upper room where we were gathered and a young man named Eutychus sitting at the window sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms, he says, do not be alarmed for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted or encouraged. So what we saw in the first six verses was kind of a macro level, 30,000 foot view of Paul's farewell tour. And now what Luke does is he kind of zooms us in on this scene in Troas where we get to walk with Paul in Troas and see what ministry was like. We get a glimpse of that and a very memorable event occurred there. So on the first day of the week, it says, the Christians were gathered together to break bread. This is, this is the earliest instance in scripture of what becomes the regular practice of Christian churches. It's the first time we have this mention of, of Christians gathering not on the Jewish Sabbath, but on, gathering on Sunday, the first day of the week, as a Christian day of worship. Right? That's why we're here. That's why we're meeting on a Sunday. That's why we're here worshiping today. Uh, this is the first instance we see in Scripture of what becomes a regular practice of Christian churches to gather together on 
the first day of the week. Christians do this to remember and to celebrate the day that Jesus rose from the grave. So we see that it was on the first day of the week on Sunday that Jesus defeated death and rose from the grave. And so Christians gather together on that day to celebrate and to remember the day that he resurrected from the grave. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 John calls this the Lord's Day. And so you may some, hear people, some, some people refer to Sunday as the Lord's Day. And that's where that comes from. It's the Lord's Day because it's the day that he rose from the, de- the dead. And it's the day that we all huddle up together and, and remember that and celebrate that together and focus on him in a very special way. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, maybe you're visiting with family or somebody brought you along or you just happen to be here and, and, and you haven't um, uh, surrendered and given your life to Christ, you wouldn't know yourself to be a Christian, I just want you to know that this is why we're doing what we're doing today. We're not here because we're earning anything. We're not here because the Bible says if you don't have perfect church attendance, God's going to smite you or something. We're, we're not here to jump through any religious hoops. We're, we're not here because this is something that we have to do to earn God's favor in our lives. We're not here for any of those reasons. We're not here because God is lacking something that we're providing in our singing and in our praying and in our preaching this morning. That's not why we're here. We are here to celebrate the fact that Jesus died and rose from the grave. That's why, that's, why we, that's why we sing what we sing. That's why we preach what we preach. We're not earning anything. We're not supplying something that God lacks. We are here doing this as an act of celebration because Jesus rose from the dead and he said, you need to do nothing except repent of your sins, trust in me. By grace through faith, you may be saved. Not by doing any of these other things that other religions would have you do to earn favor before God or to, to, to accumulate anything to tip the scales in your favor. Jesus tipped the scales in your favor by taking all of your sins on himself and dying in your place, taking the wrath of God that we each deserved, bearing that penalty in his flesh and then defeating death by rising again from the grave. And he says, that is a free gift for you. Now go and celebrate and remember that. And that's what we do. So that if, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I, I just want you to know that's why we're here. And I think that's why the Lord has you here today. That you might know that that is, is, is what the, the good news of Christianity is all about and say, how can I have that free gift too? How can I have that, 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 that offer of salvation? How may I know that and live in light of that also? We'd love to stay and talk with you. If you wanna talk more about that after the service, I'd be happy to do that this morning. But that's what they were doing. They were gathering together together to celebrate Jesus together. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, the, the, there the believers in Troas were gathered together on the Lord's day to worship. And Paul and company were, were with them. They, they were traveling, but they stopped to worship with these other Christians. And they had gathered to break bread together, just to take the Lord's supper together, remembering his body and uh, drinking a cup and remembering his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. Now, if I could say this, this, is, this isn't a primary application but, but, but if I might, I just want to commend to you, if, if you're not in the habit of gathering with other Christians, even when you travel, might I commend it? Not a law, not a sin if you don't. But you see Paul and his group here, they're traveling in another city, they're in Troas, and they just drop in on another worship gathering of Christians. And I'm glad they did. <laughs> Some cool stuff happens. I can't tell you how many times this is, this hasn't been something I've always done as a Christian, but something uh, is uh, uh, once Kim and I were married and started, uh, started a family that, that we decided to, even when we're traveling to go and worship with somebody. And, and I can't tell you how many uh, times, uh, how many times that's just incredibly blessed our family. Some country Baptist church in Thailand that we were at one time where I just looked on Google maps. and I was like, there's a cross. Okay, I think that's a church. We just wandered in, couldn't understand anything. It was an incredible blessing to that church to have us there, I think. And then we said somebody in the back that could kind of whisper every now and then what the preacher was talking about, some of the songs they were singing. I was like, hey, I know that tune. It, it was familiar. It was a way. I mean, we were so spiritually encouraged by that. I would commend that to you for a number of reasons. It, it, it's good for your own soul to not neglect the, the, the gathering of other Christians and to, to, to go and to be built up in that way. It's a, it's a blessing for other believers that you might be there. You don't know what that church is going through. And just having you or your family show up might be an incredible blessing to them that Sunday. You, uh, for yourself, might get to see uh, kind of uh, the, the, the faith from a different angle or in a fresh way that could be spiritually beneficial f- for you or to just make you more uh, excited about coming back here to First of Van. I've had that experience as well. I've gone to some churches like, whew, that was interesting. 
It's good to be back in my church. And so that may happen as well. Also think it's a statement to your own family or to those that you're visiting while you're traveling is that this is, this is important to me. It's important for us to mark that out and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus each Lord's Day. Again, not a law, just an encouragement. Well, from what we know from these early gatherings, they, they, they would have prayed together, they would have sung together, they would have taken up an offering, most likely for, for either to support other believers or to support uh, their own congregation. But Luke specifically highlights two elements here, doesn't he? From the service in Troas. Right, there, there was the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, and there was preaching. The, the word there where it says Paul was talking to them in verse 7 and in verse 9 it's the same word used for him as teaching in the synagogue. So he, he, was, he, was, he was preaching. He was teaching in a, in a way from up front in a, in a proclamation of God's word. And then down in verse 11 where it says they conversed with them. It's the same word uh, to, to, to give an address in a, in a public assembly. It's where we get our word homily. So, so make no mistake, Paul was preaching to the people there in Troas. And he preaches long into the night. He goes until midnight. I want you to note something here in verse 7. It doesn't just say that Paul preached a long message, but it tells us why. See in verse 7, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech. Their time was limited. He had this one evening to speak with them. They had this one evening to hear what it was that he would deliver to them out of God's word, and everyone was there for it. There is no commentary here in the text that Paul preached too long. So if you read this text, you're like, oh, there's a danger of long sermons. That's not what Luke is trying to say. Never hints at that. This is the one morning I feel complete freedom to preach as long as I want with this text. <laughs> Just, yeah, I won't. But, but, but you see, there's no commentary on this. It's like, whoo, that, that was a long one, Paul. doesn't say anything about that. Right? There's nothing here in the text. There's no commentary about him being long-winded or him rambling or him being verbose. No, he spoke for a long time because he had to speak for a long time. He needed to deliver this message to them. They needed to hear this message. They stayed because they needed to hear it. They were all there for it. They were all about it. This is what they wanted. This, they, they had limited time together, and they said, what better could we do with our time than to huddle up around God's word and to get more Bible, to get more Jesus? Let's do that together. First of all, you, you never know how long you have with each other. You never know. I, I, don't, I, I don't exactly remember kind of what things are like here, but up where I live in Northern Virginia and D.C., I mean, people are always coming and going, always having friends come and go. It can get tiring. It can get wearying. Always seeing people come and go. I have one uh, pastor friend up there that calls it hugging the parade. <laughs> it's what ministry is like in Northern Virginia. <laughs> it's like people are just passing by and you're like, hey, good to see you. See you. But you never know how long you have with each other. Make the most of that time. Invest that time. Engage with each other. Linger with each other. Invest in a way that will be truly formative and encouraging to your faith and to theirs. I just got a text message last week from a friend who's still living in China. A number of years ago, as we were living there in China, we had a church member who was uh, from the Uyghur people group in Xinjiang, region of China. I don't know if you followed the news, but very persecuted group of people. Our media will often refer to them as the Uyghur Muslims. They're not just Muslims, there's Christians in the people group as well. And we had one of the Christian Uyghurs who was a member at our church. And when he became a member with us, we couldn't even, put, we have a church directory, we couldn't even put him in there. We just had, we had his initials and that was it. We have pictures of everybody. It was just like a no photo available situation. But we all knew who he was. We'd greet him on Sundays, we'd pray for him. And we as a church staff and as elders, we said every opportunity you get with him, pour into him. Because the time's coming when he's not gonna be here anymore. And it happened. He got a call to go back to his hometown. He disappeared for about three years. We kept him in our membership directory. We kept praying for him. Every now and then we'd, we'd, we'd get a, 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 a scant email or text message through friend of a friend of a friend about where he was and how he was doing. 
which is typically not good. But I just got a text message last week that he's out. And it was a picture with him and one of our church members back in our city. And it was the, it was the building up and the strengthening that the Lord did in his life through our local church there and through saints in his life, knowing we don't know how long we have together. Let's, let's encourage. Let's fan into flame his faith in a way that would take him through the worst possible things that we can imagine. And I don't know a lot about what happened to him, but I do know that it was the spirit in his life and it was what he had learned from God's word that stuck in there somewhere through all the horrible treatment that sustained him through those years. Friends, we, we, we need that. We need that encouragement in our lives. Don't waste a second. Don't waste a conversation. Don't waste a Sunday. Be built up and build each other up. Well, verse 8, in Acts chapter 20, Luke mentions that there were many lamps burning. The reason he mentions there's many lamps burning is likely to set the scene for what happens next. The lamps would have been little containers of oil with a wick that was burning. And so the atmosphere in the room was probably warm with all these lamps burning and a little, maybe a little oxygen starved in the room, depending on how well ventilated that upper room was. And then, of course, it was just the hypnotic effects of the flames. There's a reason that people put couches in front of fireplaces that we can uh, relax and look with the flames and the warmth and the heat. It's, it's a great place to take a nap, unless you're in a window. All right, but that's what happens here. It's a calming, relaxing situation, and Luke kind of sets the scene for that. In verse 9, we see the, there's a young na- a man named Eutychus, which ironically his, na- his name means fortunate one or lucky, um, which I guess he was in the end. Uh, but Eutychus is sitting in the window. He's young. Uh, the word that's used there, he's probably 8 to 12 years old. Young Eutychus sitting in the window, and he's fighting to stay awake. Verse 9, he, the, 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 the word there is he's falling asleep. And then he finally succumbs, and he was overcome by sleep. And he falls three stories to his death. Now, some people wonder here in the text if uh, what exactly was going on. Was, was he dead, or, or maybe he was just unconscious, and Paul got there and kind of said, oh, his life is in him, and he, he kind of uh, encourages him or does uh, some sort of uh, kind of first responder stuff on him, or what exactly ha- happens here uh, with Eutychus. Some people argue that maybe he didn't die, but, but make no mistake, Luke is trying to describe him as being dead. Verse 9, it says that he was taken up dead. Then in verse 10, it says that Paul threw his body on the young man's. Now, I know that's not what your ESV says. It's not what my ESV says either. It says that he bent over him. But if uh, the word there in Greek is to fall upon. And so if you're looking at an NIV or a King James or a New American Standard, you have that, that, that Paul fell upon him. Now, the reason that, that this is very, very important is because we are meant, this is meant to remind us of Elijah back in 1 Kings 17. That's what Elijah does. He raises somebody uh, from the dead and he, puts, he stretches his body out on them. And then Elisha in 2 Kings 4 does the exact same thing. So we have these two prophets in the Old Testament who stretch their bodies out on these people who have died and rose them back from the grave. Here in Acts 20, a boy falls out of the window, he's dead, and Paul goes down and throws his body on top of him. It's meant to take us back to those prophets of old who did the exact same thing, the exact same posture. And it's only after Paul throws his body on top of the young man's that Paul says his life is in him. Finally, verse 12 explicitly says that they took the youth away alive, which would be a weird way, thing to say if he was never dead. <laughs> of course he took him away alive. He was always alive. No, he took him away alive because he was dead. So God through Paul, this kid, what Eutychus wasn't unconscious, he was dead, and God, through Paul, brings him back to life. Now watch what happens next. This is amazing. You might say, well, that was amazing. No, that's, not, that's nothing. What happens next is amazing. What do they do after this miraculous raising from the dead? They get back to the church service. They go back to church. Look at verse 11. When they had gone up and had broken bread... They take the Lord's Supper together. Remember earlier, that's why they gathered. They had gathered to to break bread together. They had gathered together to hear God's word preached, to take the Lord's Supper together. They haven't gotten to it yet. And so the kid dies, Paul raised him back to life, and they're like, all right, back up on the third floor. They went back up and they broke bread together. So they pressed on. Paul started preaching again. 
Remember, it already said that he had prolonged his speaking until midnight. Then this whole Eutychus event happens, raises him back to the dead. They go back up and it says he preaches again until sunrise. Until dawn, verse 12. So not only does Paul prolong his speaking into the evening until midnight, but after Eutychus dies, he, he goes all the way until dawn. Now listen, the point of this passage is not that Paul spoke too long. Luke in no way indicates that there was an issue with how long Paul spoke. No, the point isn't that Paul preached a deathly long sermon, but that he had a message of life and death importance. That's the point. They had a gathering of life and death importance that they needed to get back to. This is supported by the fact that this miracle doesn't even seem to be the point of the text. Now, again, our eyes go there because this is, a, this is kind of a shocking event. But if you look at miracles throughout the New Testament and throughout the ministry of Christ and the apostles, it's usually establishing something, right? So he, they're pressing into a new frontier or a new region. And, and to, to demonstrate the power of God, they did these signs and wonders and these miracles. Or it's, it's in some way to show that, that God's messenger has God's power or that the message was pressing into a new place. That's not the case here. The message is already, the, the gospel has already been planted in Troas. People already know Paul's authority. So the point of this miracle and this raising from the dead isn't like all of those other ones. So Luke doesn't make a big case about this, about, okay, they raised the boy from the dead and then everybody knew that Paul had the power of God in him. It doesn't say anything about that. It gives no commentary on it at all, except to say they went from there back to church. That's the commentary that Luke gives. I think Luke mentions this Eutychus event. A, because it's pretty remarkable, right? If you're writing an accounting of these events, you're going to include the Eutychus event. But B, it serves to highlight what was really important in that place and in that time, which was the gathering of Christians around the table and around the pulpit. That was really important. What an amazing encouragement, first of Anne for us, an amazing challenge for us as well. Something amazing happens in Troas. A kid is raised from the dead. And yet there's something even more amazing that happens. And it's something that you too get to experience all the time. The breaking of bread and the preaching of the word. A kid is raised from the dead and they all say, let's all go back and talk more about the one the greater one who was raised from the dead so that you and I may be finally raised from the dead when he returns. That's of utmost importance. You might say, oh, if I could just see a miracle, what, what a boost that would be for my faith. If God would just show me something like that, if he would show up in this tangible way and heal this person or do that or let me see something like that, what an incredible boost that would be for my faith. If he really wanted to encourage me and to build me up, he would show me something like that. The saints in Troas saw it and said, yeah, great. Let's get back to the word and the table. That's an incredible encouragement to our faith. You see that, don't you? They see a, a dead boy raised back to life and they, and they don't say, great, that's all I needed. Show me a miracle, that's all I need to sustain me and to build me up in my faith. And if God would just give me more of that, I would walk more closely with him. That's not what they said at all. They said, no, no, no. Boy raised from the dead, dead, that was great. Give me more gospel. Give me more Jesus. Give me more Bible. Give me more exposition of truth. Give me more remembrance of Jesus' death and resurrection that we see in the Lord's Supper. That is what gives me hope. That is what fuels my life. This word is sweeter than honey. His precepts are good. His, his commandments are, are right. They, they are what build me up. Give me more, give me more, give me more. The gathering of the saints to celebrate the Lord Jesus in community, that's what we need. That's what God wants to use to build us up. This is the means of grace that Jesus has provided in the local gathering of Christians, and it is massively important for us. First of all, essential to the Christian life is encouragement, and essential to Christian encouragement is the gathering. Church, you must devote significant time and effort toward Christian encouragement. Let me leave you with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, parakaleoing, 
one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Saints, we're almost home. Let's add courage to one another on the journey. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would use moments like these, gathered around your words, singing songs, praying to you, that you would use moments just like these, like the saints had in Troas on that Lord's day, to encourage us and to build us up in our faith. God, would you guard us from fleeting things and distractions? Indeed, help us to not be so legalistic that we would fear doing anything that wasn't what we just talked about, that we would have a, a true freedom and an and, and um, enjoyment of all the graces you give us in our lives. But God, may we not squander our time. May you encourage us through this gathering, even as we break from here and enjoy more conversations, may we confer in such a way that meditates more on the truths of the gospel and the goodness of your word. Use us to support one another in such endeavors. God, help us to see Jesus more clearly. Help us to see him as bigger and as, as all surpassing any other loves that we might have in our lives. God, may this church be a church that would not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, that would not be overtaken by times of trial and tribulation because of the way you've built us up. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.